Welcome to Adjusted Reality, a podcast series trusted by the adjusted and brought to you by the Foundation for Chiropractic Progress, where we learn from athletes, celebrities, influencers, and healthcare professionals about how to optimize health in a fun, relatable way. Join me, Dr. Sherry McAllister, as I speak with the legendary Dr. Lou Sportelli about a very scary moment in history. Our conversation will uncover how the AMA, that's the American Medical Association, plotted to destroy the chiropractic profession. But stay tuned, this very scary story will end with hope and inspiration for the entire medical profession and chiropractic profession. Dr. Lou Sportelli has served in many capacities throughout his 60 year career, starting in 1963. Many of you in the chiropractic profession that are listening will not need any introduction to him because he is in fact legendary for the incredible work he has done in those 60 years. He currently serves as president of the NCMIC Foundation, a 501c3 nonprofit research and education organization. Dr. Luz Bortelli wrote the book, Introduction to Chiropractic, a widely used book by doctors of chiropractic across the world. He has also appeared in a webinar series called Contain and Eliminate a three-part exploration of how the healthcare choices were being taken away from patients by a well-designed strategy. That strategy, well, we're going to dive into that today with our fabulous guest, Dr. Lou Sportelli. Welcome. Thank you, Sharon. It is exciting to have you because many already know who you are as a household name in the chiropractic lifestyle world. But for those that don't, I want to tell you that this man has changed the way people look at things in the healthcare arena. And the story that we're about to unfold really goes into some deep depths. And for the listener right now, I want you to understand that in order for us to have a bold, brave, beautiful future, you in fact need to learn from the past. Ask yourself questions and decide, how did we get here? And where are we going? And with that being said, with our fabulous guest today, I wanna start at the very beginning. So we're gonna go to the past. Dr. Sportelli, can you briefly tell us the very scary story of how less than six decades ago, mainstream medicine plotted to monopolize medicine therefore minimizing healthcare options for consumers across the nation with a desire to completely eradicate the chiropractic profession? Well, you know, it's kind of an interesting story in that back in the 50s and 60s, the American Medical Association was a rather prestigious organization. Matter of fact, it was often dubbed the fourth branch of government. It had that much authority and it had that much credibility. And back in those days, I mean, nobody really would have thought or even given the vaguest thought that the AMA would be involved in activities that were not only illegal, but clandestine and designed to do disruption to the actual healthcare system of the the United States. And many don't recognize that the AMA was opposed to Medicare was back in those days, uh, you know, had taken uh, millions of dollars of uh, cigarette money in order to uh, subvert the knowledge that cigarette smoking was was harmful to your health. And there's so many things, but nobody would believe that back in the 50s and 60s. And so the AMA had an opportunity to get away with an awful lot of things. So chiropractic was one of those professions that now was starting to gain traction, particularly in the state of Iowa, where Palmer College was there and and the state of Iowa had more chiropractors 
um, than most other states, and they had a lot of influence in the rural areas of, of Iowa. So therefore, the AMA got a little concerned. Uh, they were the, thinking that maybe the chiropractors were getting too much influence. So they devised a, a, an observation of the fact that chiropractors were gaining too much credibility and needed to be stopped. Back in those days, we, of course, the profession was not licensed uh, in, in all of the states. And so in 1963, which really was the, uh, the, uh, the cardinal situation, 1962, I'm sorry, uh, the AMA formed what they called a committee on quackery. Mm. The, and, and, and it was formed in a very secretive way. And the, ultimately the documents that were later on revealed, here's the key phrase. Their mission was first to contain and then to eliminate the practice of chiropractic. Now, they did it in such a clandestine way that nobody knew about it. So now it was kind of interesting and, and very personal to me only because the, they formed the committee in 1962 and I graduated in 1963. And I think, wow, I'm, I'm going to enter into a healthcare field and I'm going to have, you know, the kind of acceptance. And well, little did I realize that when I finally got into practice, the AMA had already precluded by their indoctrination of the medical community, that a medical physician, and I had this personal experience, a medical physician, I was, I was asked to join the Lions Club in my community. And the medical physician was also in the Lions Club. And when, I, when they allowed me to, to become a member, the medical physician wrote a letter and said that he had to resign because he couldn't belong to an organization that would have a quack as a member. So, and, and I understand, I, I, I had no idea of what was going on. I mean, I, that was sort of, nobody in the club kind of understood it. I went to get my patients to send them up to the hospital for blood work and x-rays. They refused to do any work for my patients. When I went to do a referral, the medical physicians refused to accept my referral. And we never had a, ref a referral. Here's a word for you. All chiropractors ever had back in those days were transferrals because you never got a patient back. So here I start practicing and pretty soon I don't understand what's happening. Patients are coming into my office. They seem to be getting, uh, they seem to be getting better. My practice is growing. And yet I had absolutely no ability to interact with the local a community or the local hospital or the local physicians. My, 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 my only opportunity to do referrals was in a town 25 miles away from me, which was a larger community in which many of the physicians um, accepted, accepted patients. Now, I, I want to draw a distinction, a clear distinction between clinical medicine and political medicine. These clinical medical guys in Allentown, Pennsylvania, which is where I and, and near had no problem. Many of them weren't even members of the AMA and didn't know what the AMA was doing from a political point of view. But it was the political medicine people that prevented chiropractors from gaining licensure, kind of chiropractors from getting included in, in uh, insurance reimbursement, getting included in Medicare, getting our colleges accredited. Now, here's a good one for you. One of the things that they claimed chiropractors were uneducated, essentially were poorly educated and therefore shouldn't be called doctors and shouldn't really be able to accept patients off the street. So the colleges collectively decided, you know what, uh, we ought to be upgrading our faculty. And so what they did was they reached out to medical physicians, the PhDs and biochemistry and all of the other clinical sciences, the basic sciences. And if a individual decided to teach at a chiropractic educational institution, they received a letter from the AMA saying, if you teach at that institution, you will never teach again in any medical facilities. So now you kind of got to ask yourself, you can't have it on both ways. You can't say we're uneducated and then prevent educators from educating <laughs> the chiropractors. Right. This is what they did in almost every instance 
It was the prevention of the profession from gaining credibility and exposure. So they prevented chiropractors. Uh, let me give you one last thing, and then we can talk about some of the other stuff. But uh, chiropractors, as you know, even today, they are fighting a battle to gain uh, Medicare inclusion in its rightful way. In other words, to whatever the state statutes would permit. Back in those days in 1968, now think about this, 1968, there were supposed to be a chiropractic hearing at the Health Education and Welfare. It was called HEW back then, not CMS, HEW. And HEW was supposed to have a hearing on chiropractic inclusion in Medicare. Well, uh, obviously that never happened. And later on, when I'll, as we go into this and tell you about the lawsuit and how we found out about all this, in the lawsuit in discovery, we find out that that the findings of that committee were written six months before the committee ever was formed, thanks to the AMA's influence. So they basically essentially lied to Congress and corrupted a congressional investigation. Uh, and chiropractors were never given a fair shot at Medicare in 1968. So that kind of sets the stage to the point where, it, if you remember, if you don't understand what's happening and you don't know why it's happening, you're puzzled and you, you just simply are baffled. And that's how we were as a profession in the 60s and early 70s. We had no idea of this incredible amount of, of force from an organization as powerful as the AMA and everything the AMA stood for which wasn't just the AMA. Now, remember, they had dozens and dozens of organizations. But to prevent chiropractors from gaining access, and, and they had a multi-pronged approach. Number one, they educated their medical physicians to denounce chiropractors as quacks. Matter of fact, uh, 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 one of the leading physicians basically said that chiropractors are cute but they're like rabid dogs and killers. Think about that kind of, of denunciation of an entire profession from the podium up by credible medical physicians. Is it any wonder that the, that the medical physicians in attendance had this negative view of chiropractic, viewing us as totally and completely uneducated and, and essentially a harm to the, to the society? But then that's not, they didn't stop there. Uh, Sherry, what they did was they launched a media campaign in order to basically ensure that the consuming public would view chiropractors as quacks. Matter of fact, back in the 60s and 70s, I used to do some interviews and I would do a word associations. And if you ask anybody the word chiropractor, the very first word that came to their mind was quacks. It, it, it's almost the same concept as back in the 50s from Japanese cars. Japanese cars were junk. And today, of course, in 2022, Lexus is probably one of the finest cars made today. So it only took them 60 or 70 years to eradicate that, that kind of negative image. But that's what they did. They, they basically targeted the people that were going to come to chiropractors and they targeted their own profession to denounce us. Well, how much more can you have against this? Well, as the story unfolds, um, the profession owes a lot to the Scientologists, believe it or not, because L. Ron Hubbard back in those days uh, wrote a book called Dianetics. And he basically thought that the, the AMA was going to um, essentially uh, you know, make him an honorary member, I think, that, that, he was, he, that this Dianetics was going to be a, a wonderful book, and it was going to eliminate a lot of things in medicine. And of course, instead of doing that, the AMA denounced L. Ron Hubbard, tried to get the Church of Scientology um, essentially uh, uh, stricken from any privileges. And so L. Ron Hubbard wasn't somebody to fool with either. He had his own spy campaign and his own clandestine investigators and so forth. And so what they did was they infiltrated the AMA the headquarters. And L. Ron Hubbard and the Scientologists were looking for whatever information they could, they could find to essentially 
see how the AMA was going to attack Scientology. And it took him several years to gain credibility and to gain access to the AMA headquarters, which they did methodically. Um, and they found not, they didn't find much. But what they did find in their investigation was this treasure trove of information against chiropractic, how they were going to essentially eliminate and contain and eliminate chiropractic. So, and the plot thickens right there, does it not? The plot thickens. Is exact. So what they did, rather than just simply not worry about it, an individual basically that was dubbed sore throat compiled that data and essentially sent it out to uh, many of chiropractic organizations and individuals. And I was one of the recipients of that packet of information. And I couldn't believe it. Um, the, law, the lawyer, who George McAndrews, who took on the lawsuit, basically said that, that uh, the AMA were historians with a death wish because they wrote everything down and never threw anything away. So all of this data that we had in these documents, which had to be validated, um, Mr. McAndrews knew what to look for and what to ask for. When in 1975, finally, a lawsuit was filed against the AMA and discovery process occurred in which they had to preserve documents and to uh, be ready for a court battle. And so that's kind of how this thing evolved all during the 60s and, in, and halfway into the 70s in 1975 when the lawsuit was filed. Dr. Sportelli, there's a few things that stood out while you were talking, and one was the campaign and how in-depth that campaign went. I know there are some very special celebrities that could not actually say they were chiropractors, and there were celebrities that were really working with the American Medical Association to provide readers with these unorthodox ways of looking at chiropractic because it was a slander campaign. Oh, and right. maybe you could just enlighten our, our listeners a little bit more about how deep on a celebrity level did this go to really ensure that chiropractic was being wiped off the map? Back in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, uh, two very popular uh, uh, magazines, uh, one of the most influential was Reader's Digest, believe it or not. It had millions of, of subscribers, but it was so powerful. Matter of fact, it was kind of funny. The Reader's Digest was sent to the medical physician's offices several weeks before it went to the general public, because in case there was something in there about healthcare that the, that the physicians would know about it in advance, in case the patients asked about it. So and then they ran a whole series. I don't know if you remember, I'm Joe's liver, I'm Joe's brain, I'm Joe's whatever. I, and so Reader's Digest, I mean, it was essentially the Bible for millions and millions of people that were well-respected. The second magazine was Consumer's Report, which still is, is both of those magazines are in existence today. From a, from a top-notch syndicated columnist point of view, um, Ann Landers had a syndicated column that was literally read by millions of readers. And Ann Landers was essentially um, influenced by the AMA with a trip to China back in those days. Uh, and, and basically what they did was provide her with information that she subsequently bought and earned and wrote about. And essentially to her readers, I mean, Ann Landers was really a hero. She was sort of the, 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 the newspaper priest, if you will. And so whatever Ann Landers said, readers listened to, and they certainly, so she called chiropractic uh, poppycock and worthless. And so mm -hmm. Reader's Digest, incidentally, the timing of these things were incredible. Reader's Digest in 1972 wrote an article titled should chiropractors be paid with your tax dollars? And it was a derogatory article. I mean, most congressmen would, would never go against that kind of a situation with Reader's Digest. 
And then we had Consumers Report that did a two-part series with the famous title, Chiropractors, Healers or Quacks. Oh. And it was a September and October issue. And both of them were absolutely devastating to the profession. And here's how far that went, Sherry. The Pennsylvania Medical Society reprinted the entire Consumers Digest article in their journal, if you can believe that. So they, they, they started to develop a, an absolutely wonderful campaign to essentially influence and indoctrinate in a very negative way the chiropractic profession to the consumers. And very effective. I mean, it, 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 took, it took decades to eradicate that. And we're still not done with it yet, but it's a heck of a lot better in, uh, today than it ever was before. It's important because there is that very difficult and unfair bullying that has happened. And the word quackery stuck and words absolutely have meanings. And it was a time where patients needed more choices and they needed to be able to consider options as we are in today's world. And there were a lot of chiropractors, very successful celebrity chiropractors that wouldn't even say that they were chiropractors because they were afraid of the wrath and the scathing that they would in fact take. And it's, it's extraordinarily unfortunate not being uh, one that would even know, like you said, you're graduating with a passionate heart, a heart to heal, someone to work with and listen to and help deliver a healthcare plan that will maximize their activities of daily living. And here you are on the backside, not even re recognizing that they were plotting to essentially wipe out anything that had to do with your treatment care and also really not wanting the patients to have options. And that's why I thought it was really interesting. There is a 1980s book and it was written by a chiropractor of a president of one of the state associations in, in the book's title in the eighties is it's your body, your choice. And it states that it's an attempt at monopolizing healthcare, which was defeated. And this was actually happening in Maine in 1973, where they took to the Senate to try to engage the politics of healthcare to completely get rid of the ability for chiropractors to practice. They tried it in Alaska and failed. They tried it in Nevada to fail, but they went to the smallest state where it hosted only 30 chiropractors. And in fact, in that book, it talked a little bit about what really happened during those Senate hearings. They essentially had to move the hearings from the government building to a larger facility because of those 30 chiropractors that stood with their patients, over 700 of them actually showed up to testify that the options were crucial, essential. And they actually also saw chiropractors coming out of jail for practicing medicine without a license. And I think those are part and parcel why it's so important to hear what happened in the past. Because when you hear the past, you can see what happens in the present. And you're right. Calling someone a quack is a very difficult title to get rid of. And some of the most amazing chiropractors today have great stories. I mean, chiropractors that have treated the presidents of the United States of America and still, still have this feeling of the past that rides with them. Still. Oh, there's no, yeah, there's no, it, it, that's an interesting point that you make. And, and I, I think that it's, it's worth um, delving into just one step deeper. And that is that despite all of the opposition, that chiropractors had back in the 40s and 50s and 60s. The reason for the success was because of the success of the practitioner to the individual patient. I mean, we talk about, matter of fact, there were brochures 
uh, uh, perhaps crude by today's standards, but one of them I remember uh, vividly was called tractor back. Well, tractor, what does that mean? It meant that those patients in the farmlands, the, the farmers and all of those who worked, remember that, that the agricultural uh, era involved an awful lot of back pain work. And when, when those patients finally had an opportunity to go to a chiropractor and relieve the problems that prevented them from working. And remember, if they didn't work, there was no other way they could survive. So the dedication and loyalty of the early patients was absolutely incredible. That's number one. But number two, since there was no reimbursement for chiropractors, patients had to pay for it out of their pocket. I, I personally believe that that was a, the finest era of, of chiropractic is that we had to really pay attention and listen to every individual patient that came along because reimbursement wasn't coming from somebody else. It was coming from that patient. And so it was in order for that patient to come back and feel like this experience was a good enough experience to have them pay out of their pocket, you had to pay attention to the patient. So I think that that whole era was why chiropractors could could am amass all, all over the country. I mean, I, I witnessed that era when busloads of patients would would essentially march on their capital to get their chiropractors licensed. And the last two states, ironically, incidentally, not to be overlooked, was Louisiana and Massachusetts. Well, now, if you look at they got licensed in the, in the late seventies, and so the two major uh, MDs on the committee on quackery was Dr. Thomas Ballantyne from Massachusetts and Dr. Sabatier from Louisiana, the last two states to be licensed. And that's no coincidence. That was because of the clout they had and they were well-esteemed physicians in their, in their community. So therefore Louisiana and Massachusetts were the last to be licensed. It's, Amazing when you think back to the politics of healthcare and oftentimes medical practitioners unfortunately get stuck between the politics and the actual care of the patient. And as we look through the past and we start to move clearly now to the present, the politics of a lawsuit is amazingly difficult. And it's hard on, on the people that are trying to support the patient and the patient's choice. And it's financially difficult to continue a lawsuit, especially as I would consider the AMA to be um, a giant in at that time, like you said, previously, it was probably the fourth level of, of government at that point. And I think back to those who had to hide that they were chiropractors because they didn't want to feel the wrath like Jack LaLanne. Most people never knew that the most incredible fitness instructor and uh, celebrity, Jack LaLanne, who was really into a holistic lifestyle, was brought, raised, and lived a chiropractic lifestyle. He was a chiropractor extraordinaire, but he also knew very wisely that in Hollywood, if you say that you're a chiropractor, that does not go a long way and can hurt you. And now I want to go to talking about hurt, which is the antitrust lawsuit that actually ensued, Wilk versus AMA. And I understand it was a very fascinating 14-year journey that changed the face of healthcare. How do you believe it impacted patients' healthcare choices today? And, and maybe you can just bring our, our listeners to what happened in that actual lawsuit that lasted for 14 years, who was impactful in that lawsuit, and then how did it impact our patients' choices? Well, we were very, very, very fortunate as a profession that, that the attorney, we, we couldn't find an attorney, Sherry. Uh, here's another thing to kind of consider how big and how powerful the AMA was. We could not find an attorney to take the case. Most, and if you didn't have, first of all, no, no attorney in Chicago where AMA headquarters were at 535 Dearborn Street would take them because, I mean, that's just obvious. But what they had was they had the largest firms 
just like many of the corporations do today, they had the largest firms on retainer, which precluded them from accepting a, a, a lawsuit against the people they had on retainer. The AMA had attorney firms all over the country on retainer. So it was, we were almost, in, not only did they think we were nuts as a, as a profession to sue the AMA, but there were no lawyers that wanted to take on the case. So it was absolutely, I, I, I say this multiple times that many instances of divine intervention occurred. George McAndrews, who was, a, who was the attorney who finally took the case, his father was a chiropractor and he witnessed his father's denigration in, in his practice um, by the medical community. But he also saw that his father became a chiropractor because he was cured of asthma. Hmm. And so there was a very substantial kind of a connection. And of course, in McAndrew's family, there are just dozens of chiropractors as a result of, of that particular situation. So we were look, lucky to have uh, George take on the case, which incidentally, uh, his law firm wasn't too happy about because there were medical physicians in his law firm. And ultimately, George Loss uh, had to leave his law firm and start his own firm as a result of the pressure that he was receiving. And he didn't receive the kind of help he, he should have from, from his law firm. But the first trial was a mistake. The first trial, the AMA had a, uh, had a philosophy that um, this was about consumer protection. And of course, if you look back in those days of the 50s and 60s and early 70s, the chiropractors' advertisements, some of them were a little questionable, a little shabby, and you could make a, a case that, hey, they were uh, over-claiming and, and under-delivering. But that had nothing to do, that, none of that had anything to do with the fact that the AMA was attempting to contain and eliminate, essentially form a boycott to eliminate a licensed profession. They had no basis to do that. And so unfortunately, we, the chiropractors lost the first lawsuit. And the first lawsuit was a jury trial. And many of the jurors had contacted McAndrews and said, we really wanted to vote for you, but the instructions from the judge precluded that. And so the second lawsuit that was ensued after, after George lost the first one and he filed to file a second lawsuit, the second one he filed, no jury. And, and therefore the AMA was thrown off of their uh, perch essentially because they, in the second lawsuit, it was about whether or not there was an economic boycott to destroy the profession. It was clearly illegal to do that. And so by focusing on that aspect of the lawsuit, which was lost in the first lawsuit, and the judge, and here again, divine intervention, the new, new judge, I mean, Judge Susan Getson there, who basically um, became a, a, a judge at that time and didn't have any cases and was kind of as the story goes, wandering around the rest of the judge's offices and saying, you know, what do you have to do? And the one judge looked and said, well, there's, you know, 26 boxes of stuff from this chiropractic case. And so she thought it was kind of interesting. Fortunately, she had a, an absolutely brilliant mind. And, and so she saw right through this thing uh, that there, this was clearly, at, and her, her words haunt me to this day. She said, that the lingering effects of this conspiracy will last for decades and how right she was. And in her opinion, which was a 101 page opinion, and the, the most devastating thing to the AMA was that they, the judge ordered them, ordered the AMA to publish in their journal, the Journal of the American Medical Association, this case and the results of that trial. Many of the members of the AMA had no idea this was going on. Why, how do I know that? Because 
after we announced this thing, we got letters from many of the physicians who were embarrassed, many of them who opened up and said, wait a minute here, I am totally embarrassed here. I'm all going to open up my facility to, to chiropractors. I'm going, I didn't know, none of them knew, uh, many of them didn't know any of this was happening. So, so the second lawsuit, when it was won, was a game changer. Um, it was a game changer because of a number of reasons and that the way to enter the medical arena was either privately a patient could come to a, a chiropractor or go to a medical physician, but also the hallowed walls of the hospital were almost forbidden for chiropractors. They couldn't get laboratory work. They couldn't get x-rays. So what, did it, what, it, what had happened to the chiropractors is because of, the, of essentially being excluded from, from hospitals, almost every chiropractor had to invest in an expensive x-ray machine and do it on their own. And so all of these facilities now became essentially opened up to chiropractors. And then the insurance industry looked at this thing and said, wait a minute here. Um, we're kind of doing the very same thing with reimbursement. So many of them looked at their reimbursement policies. And so they began to open up the reimbursement policies to chiropractors in the fear of litigation was a really wonderful stick, essentially, that were, was hanging over the heads of some of these organizations who thought twice now about whether or not they would di discriminate against chiropractic. And so lots of things open. And just as a, as a, as a side note, you mentioned um, chiropractors who were afraid to say they were chiropractors because of harm. To, but, you know, we had back then we didn't have many, but we had a few chiropractors who were DCs, but also held Ph.D. degrees. They could not get published in any peer reviewed journal using their DC. The publication would not print doctor of chiropractic they would prevent print their bachelor's degrees their master's degrees their phd but they would not give credibility to the dc degree and several of those are still alive today dr john triano dr reed phillips and, and a number of them that basically uh and it was kind of funny they still retain the letters they received back from the journal saying we can't we'll we'll publish your article, but we'll only use your master's degree or your PhD, but we can't use your DC degree. So that's how, so when you think about it, those, those, those publications are peer reviewed. So anybody who wants to do any research, any, anybody looking up the data goes to the peer reviewed journals and they never see a DC. And so think about the fact that it, it basically poisoned the minds of the academics it poisoned the minds of the practitioners, it poisoned the minds of the public. What a brilliant way to essentially eliminate a profession. It and is a brilliant. It, and if it weren't for the lawsuit and the discovery, and I, I, I want to sidebar here for just a moment, Sherry, to, to tell you a little story that maybe most people don't know. When you have a lawsuit and, and you have discovery, there's a, what's called the preservation of documents. Well, the AMA received the order to preserve the documents and they preserved the documents. At least they said they did. And they put it in a cart. And, and then they had to tell the judge that the janitor thought it was garbage and destroyed it. So all of the documents that the AMA was to provide essentially were gone. So now where does that leave George? Well, fortunately, back then, there was no internet, there was no social media. So obviously, the state associations across the country didn't get the memo to destroy the 
AMA documents. And so that's why George McAndrews traveled to 42 states, got had subpoenas for the for the medical associations in those states. And that's how we got the documents from the state medical societies that the AMA claimed they didn't have anymore. Isn't that's that amazing? How, that's how it, those documents were validated. It makes you pause and think, what are you committed to in your life? How far would you go, especially when you're up against a giant? 42 states, yep. the American Medical Associ- Association, and your own career that you fought for in being in your own law firm, working with others, and not being able to get the support or commitment, yep. and knowing that it's right and it's just, and then having a brilliant judge come in, divine is really the only yep. word. Yep. And I have to ask you going back, because the, the lawsuit was... Wilkes versus AMA for the consumers. We had a, a very unfortunate loss of Chester Wilk. Can you explain who Chester was? Who is Chester Wilk and how did he get involved? Well, Chester was kind of one of those old time chiropractors that was on essentially, um, he had the same experience that we did in terms of not being able to get referrals, not being able to use the facilities. And so he started to think about the fact that what was happening here and, and, and Chester documented some, some early uh, material. And so on, uh, continued to collect, I should say the, the kind of material that would help to fortify when he finally wanted to present to the profession that we ought to sue the AMA. And of course, remember now, suing the AMA, I mean, people had to think you ought to be locked up and put in a packed room if you're thinking about suing the American Medical Association. I mean, here we were, you talk about it, uh, you really talk about David and Goliath, you're really talking about David and Goliath. Yes, you here are. We had, here we had a, a splintered profession with very little money and, and very little resources, very little wherewithal, very little connections. And, and so here we're going to sue the AMA. And so many of the chiropractors were kind of scared about doing that. And fortunately, there was a dedicated group that decided that, no, you know what, this, we have enough evidence. And when sore throat documents came out and we saw the documents, and if in fact they were validated, then there was no question that the profession was in a violation and their entire being was threatened to be eliminated. So there was no other, there was no other choice left. And so Chester, fortunately, um, was, was dedicated enough and decided to continue to push forward. And that's what he did. And there was five other, four other chiropractors that basically joined him. Uh, and, and unfortunately, as time goes on, uh, we are, we're losing almost all of them, uh, of the original plaintiffs. I think it's so important to look over the ability to take on something so enormous and affect hundreds of millions of patients in this lawsuit and not knowing at that time how much of an impact. It reminds me of the story and practice that I have with a top-notch award-winning physician that came into my practice and had severe low back pain. And he said to me, Sherry, you know, one thing that I don't know, I came here because one of my colleagues at Stanford University said I should, I was totally against it. And all I could hear in the back of my mind was quack. And he said, you're the only person that has ever helped me in the last 25 years with my back pain. I am the pain. I am low back pain free because of you. And I want to apologize on behalf of all of my colleagues that the word quack would ever be associated with your name. And I asked him, I said, do you have any idea how we got the term quack? And he said, no. And I told him the story that our listeners are hearing now. And the look on his face was as if I had slapped him because he was in such shock that this had actually transpired, that this story could actually be true. And I want the impact for patients' healthcare choices not to be lost in all of this because we fought as chiropractors for the patient, not for ourselves. We fought for the patient's choices. And what I want to ask you now, being in the present, what's the relationship like in your personal opinion between primary care providers and other healthcare professionals today 
And did the Wilkes versus AMA case have an impact on these relationships? Uh, the answer to both questions is, is it had a phenomenal impact and, and the world has changed radically. Let me, let me also preface by saying, and, and I say this, sometimes I uh, am embarrassed uh, to say it only because it, it, it seems so shocking. And that is that the prejudice changes one funeral at a time. And so I basically, I say to, and I say to patients when I was practicing and they would say, my, my, fa my physician is opposed to you. And I would ask, how old is your physician? Because there's no question about the fact that, and, and many of them, listen, th th that's the way education, that's why if you start educating whatever the fact that you're looking to educate and you start early, it never, it never changes. It rarely ever changes. So the AMA that ingrained in the minds of their graduate medical physicians, that chiropractors were quacks and nothing's going to, not much is going to change that except perhaps a personal experience of the uh, doctor who came to you. Okay. Uh, and I, I treated medical physicians as well. I, I, I remember vividly one, one coming into my, uh, into my reception room and asked for me and my, my staff didn't know who she was. And, and basically they got me and she came out, she introduced herself and she looked at me and she says, where are your horns? <laughs> I said, oh, I said to her, gosh, I just shaved them today. And so she, I, I, and I said to her, well, how did, she said, I, you know, obviously does, don't all chiropractors have horns because obviously in med school, she was a vascular surgeon and, in, and, and an ER trauma surgeon. And she just happened to be curious enough to stop into a chiropractor's office. So the, 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 the ingraining uh, material, it, it's not going to leave very easily. It just isn't. So what I'm, as we've gone now to the prophetic words of Judge Getzendanner, that the lingering effects of this conspiracy will last for generations is absolutely true. And with it, now we've gone through, essentially, Sherry, every, if you look at eight, eight years, take eight years off of the last lawsuit, which was, it was resolved in 92, add eight years onto that. Now we're into 2000 and 2008 and 2004, and we're now into, so we've got four or five generations of medical physicians that have been gone through their educational status and, and really hadn't been ingrained quackery. So the young graduates of, of medicine and osteopathy and other primary care, basically they don't even know the story. I mean, they, they don't know that there's they that they should be prejudiced. And if they are, it's for another reason. It's not, it's because of some other reason, not because they were ingrained that way. So I would say to you, how how is it impacted? It's impacted phenomenally. I will I will say to you that in in our lifetime yet, within the next decade or or so, I believe that there will be a degreed agnostic in healthcare. It will now then focus on scope of competence, not scope of licensure. And whoever owns whatever area, whether it's the brain, whether it's the spine, whether it's whatever, that, that will be the practitioners, regardless of their degree next to their name. Now, so I, I, ser I served, you ask about the medical situation. I served on our hospital board of trustees for 30 years, started in 1988 when it was not popular. And what I would hear from the physicians is this word, and, and this is the word that transcends everything. They'd nudge me and say, hey, Lou, can you give me the name of a chiropractor? I can trust. So it became a situation in which we had to earn the trust over that generation. And today, hospitals are now making preparation to essentially 
admit or coexist or co-admit chiropractors within residency programs and and uh, other areas of of uh, healthcare delivery. So it has come almost full circle, and I believe that in the next couple of years there will be almost no barriers to entry for chiropractors. Fabulous, and I I think when we think of the consumer listening today, one of the big pieces is um, how did the lawsuit touch their life? And I will tell you that it touched their lives because they have options. We didn't give up and there is more than one way to optimize your health. There is more than one way to take pain away than an opiate with a population in the United States that is devastated by the opioid crisis. And when patients start to deliver the expectations of options and knowing it's their body and their choice for these options on what they wanna take, it collectively creates a value proposition, just like you just said. One of the things, the stories that is masterful is a chiropractor treating in the traumatic brain injury at one of the universities in Florida. Well, one day after 1,300 employees, there was a package that was delivered to the chief medical officer, and in it was a glass bowl. And it's a Preskini Award. It's given to a physician who has exceeded expectations to the point of 100% patient satisfaction. I'm going to repeat that, 100% patient satisfaction. Well, I can assure you, it's not given very often. So of those 1,300 employees in the 25 years that that institution's been around, they've received one, and it was given to a chiropractor. So I give kudos to Dr. Susan Welsh and the facility that she is because last year she was given the second one. So that tells you how important it is to have choices and how important those choices are for the consumer to make and that patient satisfaction speaks volumes. And that's one of the keys. Can you tell us a little bit now about where Where are some of the chiropractors that you're very proud of right now and what kind of work are they doing so that our our new consumers are enriched on what the future looks like? Well, there's no question. And uh, before we forget, um, there's an important point that you just made. I don't want to have it glossed over. Two things occurred recently in our healthcare history in this country. One of them was the opioid crisis which raised some serious red flags only because of the deaths that it, the deaths that, that opioids have caused. And the second one's a pandemic. Now, let me, let me just elaborate for that for a minute because the opioid crisis um, in part um, had its genesis in the fact that the Joint Commission on Accreditation um, basically had pain as one of its criteria for hospitals to become reaccredited. So if if you focus on saying, I don't want any patient in pain, and that's going to be one of the criteria where to judge you, what do you think is going to happen in that hospital in order to get it at all the hospitals across the country I'm talking about, not just any hospital, all of them. So what happened was pain medication, including opioids, and and the entire opioid process was lied to by the Purdue family, uh, making it less addictive than it was, making the opioids as if they were M&Ms. So let's give them to the patients. Little did they realize that within seven days, somebody could be addicted. So what we... So we essentially, it was a self-created epidemic of opioids. And so all of a sudden, the healthcare system stopped for a moment and said, wait a minute, look what we've done. That's why you're seeing non-pharmacological approaches to, to pain that do not include opioids. Well, now the literature, which is fantastic, 
is strongly suggestive that particularly in back pain, chiropractic is as effective, incredibly effective, in the reduction of pain without the use of opioids. Well, okay, score one up for the, 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 the chiropractors. The second thing I think that came about in this pandemic, Sherry, is the awareness of the general public about the significance of the immune system. Who thinks about the immune system? I don't get up in the morning. Nobody gets up in the morning and says, well, you know what? I really got to pay attention to my immune system. But when you have a pandemic, it becomes top of your mindset. Why is this pandemic coming through like a tsunami? How many people have been affected because they have comorbidities because they have metabolic syndrome, because they have diabetes, because they're overweight, because they're out of condition, because, and because, and because, and because. So all of a sudden now the awareness about the immune system. So now we're starting to say, gee, you ought to take care of yourself. You ought to be, you ought to reduce weight. You ought to get away from all the metabolic syndrome. You ought to, so in order to boost your immunity, you have to do all the things that make you natural and healthy which is what chiropractors have been talking about for 50 years that I know. So I'm just saying two convergences that were essentially catastrophic have in essence created a very positive situation in terms of the mindset of the consumers who are now looking at how do I keep my immune system strong and how do I avoid uh, pain without opioids? So I think both of those were absolutely powerful things that happened. You've got to have to look at them in the global sense from 30,000 feet. They were both incredibly wonderful situations that changed mindsets and paradigms. Absolutely well said. And so incredibly important on the aspect of the environment to which you own. The environment to which you own is internal. An internal environment means you make choices every single day, what goes in your mouth and how you react, and also how you respond to the environment to which you're in. Are you exercising? Are you getting proper sleep? And it's really the chiropractic message that you just touched on is now the message is clear that it's your responsibility, it's your obligation to your community to really look at the environmental impact that's going on internally because the external environmental community is happening with or without you, and we'd like it to be with you than without you. And I know there are still some that are just more ignorant on the benefits of chiropractic care. One happens to come to my mind that really may have had one experience with a chiropractor, may have not even read the research that has come out, and that really does need to see the benefit, the impact um, research with, with researchers that really are putting out, like Dr. James Waden, which talks about um, the impact that opioids have on our aging community. And that you can reduce tremendously the amount of opiates that are used in this community because they're naturally losing their balance. And when you take an opioid, it can often have a greater impact or an adverse event if in fact you do get COVID. And that's some of the research that is now coming out that many people had no idea on. And I think those that haven't seen the literature that may have had an experience that wasn't a, the perfect experience, they need to step back a second and ask themselves, was it the practitioner or was it the profession? And that's oftentimes, as I think back to Albert Einstein on intelligence, because the measure of intelligence is the ability to change. And I believe our listeners are willing to change how they look at their health, the responsibility they have in their community to their family, their friends, and how we can move that forward. But I'd like you to touch Dr. Sportelli as we end this segment on how collectively do we preserve patients' choices now in the future and continue to move the needle forward for healthcare options, such as chiropractic and the natural approach, because we now know that there is no pill for every ill. It's real and it's raw. And now we need to be bold. What say you, Dr. Sportelli? Well, I think I, I, I'm optimistic. And why am, why am I optimistic? Uh, for two reasons, sure. Number one, I, I think if you look at the population 
globally, okay? Uh, and remember the silliness of um, 60, age 65 for Social Security. Uh, back when they passed that, there weren't many people living to age 65. So that was a good number because they were probably never going to have to pay very many people. Well, now the fastest growing percentage segment are the people over 100. So for, by percentage. So now you take from 65 to 100 is, the, is not only the grain of America, but also the musculoskeletal aspect of the aging of America. Well, I can tell you who better to care for this enormous segment of the population than chiropractors. That's why it's so critical because, you know, I, it, it's, it's amazing. Uh, I, I used to love to take care of, of senior citizens only because their expectations were low and whatever was a benefit was enormously viewed as a positive for them. I mean, I, you know, just being able to comb my hair in the morning or brush my teeth when I couldn't do that before because of my shoulder or my back or my spine. I mean, when you talk about the activities of daily living, the activity of daily living are incredible. And, you know, I, I a number of years ago, Sherry, I, I, when I was involved with one of the journals, we did a we did a a, a survey of of um, nursing homes, and you know as I talked to the people in the nursing home, they weren't afraid of dying. What they were afraid of most was the loss of dignity, and what did the loss of dignity mean? Their ability to not take a bath, their ability to not comb their hair, their ability to not put on makeup, their ability to not brush their teeth. The very things that we take for granted every day. But when you're in that position, that loss of dignity is a greater trauma than, the, than their fear of death. And you know, that, that kind of concept never left me. I mean, it, it is so significant that we overlook it. Sometimes we don't focus on it enough. But I want to tell you the amount of benefits that, that the chiropractic profession, because of their focus on musculoskeletal and neuromuscular issues in this population that's incredibly growing, age 65 to 100. There's a population that's being ignored simply because of laws and simply because of lack of Medicare, simply because of a number of issues that we need to con concentrate on. And many of these people are in institutions that haven't opened up the current yet. So I will suggest that that's one segment of this population that we really, really need to concentrate on and focus and what we can do to impact the quality of their lives by simple things, brushing their teeth is enormous. I mean, uh, so that's one area that I, I find to be just incredibly powerful in terms of a driving force to continue to change. Um, so you ask about uh, the, the, the second thing I think about is, is that what's going to have to happen, something's going to have to happen to the reimbursement system in our country. Now, the, the Medicare has been threatening or CMS has been threatening to change the reimbursement model. Actually, the biggest barrier to entry for uh, uh, the whole healthcare system is fee for service. It's a model that absolutely invites um, a lack of care and concern because fee for service is paid for whether you make a mistake or whether you're the top one in your field. So I will suggest to you that the entire fee for service is going to change. It's going to change to a value based payment. And if you look at the words of, of, of Donald Berwick, the triple aim. What's the triple aim? The triple aim is outcomes and cost and patient satisfaction. Well, you mentioned, and incidentally, uh, hospitals pay attention to Press Ganey, like you mentioned with Dr. Welsh, and they, and, and they should because every single hospital is accredited and Press Ganey's scores are high. 
the private practitioners in the field don't really care much. But now you look and see that there's about 80 or so percent of all the medical physicians are now employed by hospitals. Chiropractors aren't, but now they're going to have to focus on press Ganey scores for themselves that they never did before. Chiropractors have always enjoyed a high level of patient satisfaction. That's just the way we, we practice. It's the way we care for. It's the way we touch. And so all of those go into patient satisfaction. So I'm suggesting that when a value-based model of reimbursement that's fair and you eliminate fee-for-service for those, for example, there's so many, there's so many orthopedic procedures today that are not validated. They're not, they're not, there's no evidence to support them, but they're paid a lot of money to do. When it finally comes to show me the results and show me the research, the chiropractic profession at this point in time has a absolutely treasure trove of research to demonstrate our cost effectiveness, our outcomes, and our patient satisfaction. So if only musculoskeletal. I'm not, su- I'm not suggesting for one minute that that's our limitation, but if only for musculoskeletal, which happens to be the biggest percentage of people of why people seek uh, care, whether it's from a physician, a PT, a, a, a chiropractor, whoever, it's for it's for musculoskeletal problems. And so, if if you just use that model and use where we shine, uh, my optimism for for tomorrow is very, very high because we excel in every one of those criteria. It's beautiful. It's a beautiful thing to let many know that value-based care is what most people are already being measured by. Whether you are a CEO of a large corporate 50 company, you're measured on outcomes. And at the bottom line, the stockholder wants great outcomes. And at the extreme where you're going way past medicine, but you're going into the airline industry, well, outcomes are extraordinarily important. And that's why you see very few now accidents that happen in the sky, because we know that value care or value-based opportunities maximize the ability for not only fiscal responsibility, but community improvement. And that goes across many, many skills. So why should we not all be measured by what we produce and not by the speed of which we can treat a patient or by the fact that, well, I'm going to get paid really well for this. So even if the patient may not need it, but maybe in the future could need it, let's do it anyway. That's not what we want this future to look like. We want a future where the outcomes speak for themselves. They're real and they're important and they're maximized by the healthcare practitioner's education and ability to thrive in an environment that's changing quickly. And the research, Dr. Sportelli, that you've been involved with from your foundation is massive. And it's important for the patient. It's important for the healthcare providers, because when we all collaborate, the world becomes a much better place to work for the patient. Patient Patient-centered care. That's what we want. We want to hear them. We want to help them. And we want to maximize their daily living. And you're so right when you talk about dignity. And all of us are aging as you have aged while listening to this adjusted reality (laughs) episode. And we have to reflect on how do we want to age? What are our responsibilities to age? Who are we caring for that we love that may be grandparents or, or our own mother and father? And listening to this episode, I hope that you know Chiropractors are with you and for you to take care of your family and your community in a non-surgical drug-free approach to maximizing and optimizing, as professional athletes would say, performance. So Dr. Luce Bartelli, it is a pleasure and an honor and in most gratitude from every chiropractor across the world. Thank you for your service. Thank you for your undeniable resilience and fighting and making a difference in today's world. We greatly appreciate you. Thank you very much. I appreciate it, sir. Thank you for tuning in to Adjusted Reality as we spoke to Dr. Lou Sportelli about the past, present, and future of not only the chiropractic profession, 
but also about healthcare as a whole. It's with actionable hope and inspiration that we were able to move the needle forward to optimize patients' health and maximize their performance. This podcast was brought to you by the Foundation for Chiropractic Progress. As a special gift for listening today, visit f4cp.org slash health to get a copy of our Mind, Body, Spirit ebook, which focuses on many ways to optimize your health and the ones you love without the use of drugs or surgery. Don't forget to subscribe, share the podcast with family and friends, rate and review. If you're feeling inspired to learn more about chiropractic or to find a doctor of chiropractic near you, visit f4cp.org slash find a doctor. We appreciate your support and look forward to checking in with you again soon.